It's truly a new world. And, you know, you can imagine a scenario in which in the future that's kind of standard. The nature of work and where work is going is changing. And we're right in the middle of that. Olivia Nadebaum, she is the chief operating officer of Dropbox. Olivia, tell us about Dropbox and tell us about your role at Dropbox. As you mentioned, I'm the COO of Dropbox and I have an amazing leadership team. It covers sales, marketing, customer success, business development, people, comms, and brand. Now a quick thank you to Productive, a SaaS management platform that unlocks the power hidden in your SaaS applications to bring you higher ROI, better team collaboration, and lower license costs. When we talk about the future of work, it seems that Dropbox really is right in the middle of it. I mean, we certainly use Dropbox. We have, in our Dropbox account, we have like 100 terabytes. Wow. And, wow. and we're not the only folks who use Dropbox <laughs> a lot. You have a lot of customers. So, so what are you seeing about this changing future, changing nature of work? There's so much, Michael. It's It's been obviously quite a journey, not only for our customers, but for our employees and broadly in the, in the world at large. For our customers, we saw uh, early movement and spikes in trials and usage as uh, customers and future customers were considering and using Dropbox in the, the quite quick shift, as we all know, <laughs> to work from home. And we saw them getting to know the technology and understanding the technology and also understanding the broader ecosystem that Dropbox leverages in order to provide a full solution to our customers. So we saw Zoom integrations go up by 20x. We saw Atlassian and Slack all being used while on the Dropbox platform. So we could see, okay, these are folks that are working from home. They're using us for their inflow work and they're trying to focus and get their job done kind of in the middle of all that's around them. And, and then we also saw immediate needs, right? We saw hospitals that needed us immediately to manage their, their beds and how to do patient intake. We had a, a hospital in Boston who we expanded overnight to make sure that they could do that. We saw the Red Cross out of Italy using us. We All of these organizations that not only were in the world of move to remote, but also in the world of actually responding to what we were experiencing globally at the time. So in a way, the key theme was suddenness. Right. It was quite an immediate shift. I'm sure you felt it as well, personally. I know I felt it. Uh, I joined Dropbox on February 6th. And on March 6th, I was sitting at home. And so, uh, yeah, it, and all that went with it. So it, it, we're really here to help our customers go through that, that shift. Are these shifts long-lasting shifts? Is it temporary? What do you see? One of the things we're trying to do is be very thoughtful about what is this quote unquote new reality. And Drew, our CEO, has thought a lot about it and continues to really lead our thinking on what is it about this world that we want to keep for the long term, to your question, and what is it the parts that we kind of want to, when given the opportunity, want to go back to normal. I would say there's actually a lot of elements of this that we now have the opportunity to design the future of work, right? Obviously we shifted and we adjusted, but there's also this opportunity to say, okay, what is the ideal end state? And of course, as a technology company, we think deeply about how do we enable that end state? And we see that as an opportunity. We also see that as an immense responsibility because if we can figure this out, then we can help customers and users all over the world operate in this new reality. And we take that responsibility very seriously. So when you say we think about the end state, can you elaborate on that? Because it's, um, you know, the future of work and how people are work is so, is, is, are dictated to such a large extent by factors under no one's control. So how do you, how do you manage that and think about that? We think about the different dimensions of it. So we think about what are the important elements of people physically being together? 
What is the kind of work for which one physically needs to be with a colleague or a peer or in a, in a team environment? And then we think about, and this is again, end state, right? We, in the US anyway, in many places, we don't yet have the luxury of, of living that, but we really are trying to think end state, right? And so, and then we think about, well, actually, what are the, the elements that are potentially better done in a remote and distributed way? And what are the benefits that a company and a team has when they're able to work in a remote distributed way? And there are a lot of benefits. There are a lot of benefits. You know, one of the ones that I care passionately about is, is diversity. I think that and, and the leadership at Dropbox believes that the more distributed remote work that we have, the more opportunity we have to hire and engage candidates that otherwise might not want to move into the hub of the Bay Area or the hub of New York or some of these places that come with high living expenses, complexity in terms of work-life balance, long commute times, all of these things, right? Right. So for us, we see that element of it really as an opportunity to hire a much more diverse employee group uh, as we kind of figure out this long-term mixture of being able to work from home as well as being part of an office. This notion of being able to hire diverse teams is very heavily enabled by the remote distributed workforce or the capability, the ability to work. The ability, right. Yeah, we have customers um, and I'm sure we all know teams who just had never gone through the paces of working remote, right? And so now everyone's made that shift. It was almost like if you talk to CIOs around the world, this was change management that that they had been working on is like, how do we educate employees? How do we help employees understand this and what they need to do? And all of a sudden, we kind of got a boot camp in that. (laughs) So now that we're through that, what, what, what can we do? And again, Dropbox takes very seriously the role that we have to play in helping uh, team members and individuals play in in a distributed world and and be very focused and high functioning and then still have time to do the other things that are important in life like be with your kids or go for a run or care for an elderly parent whatever it may be you described or you mentioned dropbox's role in creating this distributed workforce world elaborate tell us more about dropbox's place in that what do you see as dropbox's role We play a couple roles. The first I would say is choice. So our first desire is to make sure that people who are trying to get work done and trying to collaborate uh, on the personal side or in a business environment have choice and ability to seamlessly do that collaboration. And so we view ourselves as a platform, a Switzerland platform, in which our customers and our users can use different applications that they need to do their job, but in a very, very seamless way. So they're able to be on the Dropbox platform, but they're popping into Zoom or they're using Slack or they're using Atlassian, you name it, any one of those integrated partners that we have, but they're coming back and and being at home in Dropbox. One of the things that I'm hearing you say is creating this very kind of seamless and very and easy to work in in environment. Mm-hmm. And so as you're going through the product design process, what are the the attributes or how do you how do you create products that don't get in the user's way? And especially as your user base increases and you have users who are not computer experts, but they're just ordinary people who are now working from home and they never did that before. It's about that easy user experience, that it's seamless, it flows, you're able to stay in flow, right? So you're able to use the technology to make sure that you don't get notifications if you're trying to focus and that you're able to be interacting with only the people you wanna be interacting with in that moment of flow to do the work you wanna do. And the, the product teams think deeply about really starting with the customer what is the customer experience and how do you take all the noise out of what otherwise seems to happen in our day-to-day lives? So it's, it's very much the focus is 
that customer experience and that ease of use that we pour a lot of time and energy into to enable to enable folks that are working um, on our platform. And I would say our mission uh, as a reminder is to design a more enlightened way of working. And uh, Drew and the leadership team at the time that they came up with that firmly, obviously are passionate about that as am I. And it seems even more relevant now in this new world where we do, we need to figure out a more enlightened way of working as we find ourselves in the situation that we are in today. What are some of the key challenges that you face, that a company like Dropbox faces when designing a product that's used at such a scale? Uh, how, many, how many users do you have right now, roughly? We have hundreds of millions of users and uh, we take that very seriously. We uh, know that they're there because they love the product and they love the ease of use. And so for us, we want to make sure to continue to do that. You asked the question of how do we think about overall operating at that scale? Uh, We start with that organic adoption, right? And we know that our job is to deliver an enlightened experience for those users as they use us in trial or if they sign up for um, a basic account or as they move to additional functionality that they need. Our history has been this bottom-up adoption of, of people all over the world that just love the product. And we continue to be responsible and and feel very accountable to drive that ongoing, amazing customer experience. Do you have a large customer experience team? I mean, how do you how do you go about creating a customer experience that doesn't get in the way and that is easy to use for at at such a large scale? Well, we really think about it, Michael, end to end. So uh, as many folks are familiar with, there's this process called new product introduction or NPI in the the tech industry. And we think about how we bring and how we um, take the input of all of our customers and the usage that we're seeing uh, on the product itself and use cases and jobs to be done and the, the, the design team and the research team and the product team take that very seriously and really just do an amazing job of taking all those inputs and then also thinking in a visionary way about, hey, what are some things that maybe our current users today haven't quite thought of, but in the future, we think this would be incredibly valuable to bring to our customers. And and it's just a delight to see those teams in action. Uh, And I would also say we take very seriously what we call uh, post-sale and the loyalty loop, right? So, okay, now a customer's using us and they're giving us feedback and we provide these community forums for customers to provide us feedback at scale, but we're also talking to customers. As as you know, before before this, I was just on the phone with a customer getting feedback, right? And and, and those customers, we take that uh, with, with great importance because those customers have taken time out of their day to tell us what's working and where they would love our help doing another job or expanding the functionality in some way. So we take that customer feedback loop also very, very seriously as we think about how to design products for our customers and future customers. With hundreds of millions of users, if your product has an issue, my guess is you're going to hear about it and pretty, yes. pretty darn quickly too. Yeah. I mean, again, my hat's off to not only the product team and the engineering team, but also our infrastructure team and our platform team, because as you, as you all know, there's a, there's a huge infrastructure uh, engine that is so amazingly highly tuned to be delivering what it is that we're delivering from a product perspective. So, you know, it, it's really an, an enormous task and ones that the team take very seriously and I, and I think do a great job of it. But it really is that ongoing input from the customer. And we always have our ear to, to the ground in terms of what the customer needs and, and, and uses and how we provide that at scale in a way that um, it provides value over time and also continues to provide value over time. We very much take seriously that uh, our customers are here with us, but we have a commitment to them to, to continue to increasingly deliver value over time. And we're hard at work doing that. We have a question from Twitter, and Stephanie Waxman asks, 
She says, Olivia, do you have any advice for leaders on how to maintain or create a good remote culture? Any specific examples of how you've done this at Dropbox during this time? Human element is really important. And how do you build teams that feel a, a human bond to each other, right? Because I think at the end of the day, people come to work most often for the people they, they surround themselves with and and how do they engage with those people and how do they work as a leadership team. And so uh, what, what we've been trying to do and really hats off to uh, a number of teams at Dropbox that are so thoughtful about this, the, the, um, the people team and the comms team put a tremendous amount of thought into realizing that, okay, we need to be engaging much more frequently with our employees. Uh, we need to be communicating on a frequent basis. We've really upped uh, our all hands and the expansiveness of our all hands. I know that we as, as exec staff members have um, been sending all out weekly emails to the entire set of teams that, that we um, uh, work with. And so for us, we think about continuing to build that human connection and feeling um, a real sense of need to communicate. So what in the previous world might have been felt a bit as over communication, I think you, you can't over communicate in a remote world. So I think that would be my, my primary thought. Uh, and, and it's important to, to communicate on all fronts, both how we're going to set boundaries between um, work and, and, and everyday life, how we're going to focus the company and set goals for the company and deliver on the things that we said we'd deliver as a company, what things we're going to do as a team to build the team and to uh, drive people's um, development over time. So there's a myriad of things to be communicating about. I would say that that, that ongoing interaction, I believe, will continue to be one of the most important things for us as we operate in this new world. How much of your time is actually involved dealing with these, can we say, either transition issues or just helping employees manage the, you know, the things that come up? I mean, the fact that employees have kids and schools may be open or may not be open and there's challenges and difficulties whether they're open or not, those schools. We spend a real portion of time on it. Yeah, I mean, it's because people are what matter the most, right? And so making sure that our employees have everything they need uh, to do work and are able to focus and have the resources they need, we take that very seriously. And there are teams at Dropbox who, who really spend countless hours thinking deeply about it. And it's really across all functions right? We're coming together and making sure that we're making decisions at the, at the right pace. Uh, and I saw that early on, you know, I would say I was a little bit more of an observer, right? I was month one in my job and this crisis management team came together and it was across all functions and we were meeting daily and making decisions daily about what our employees needed, what guidance we should give, what communications we should give. And I have to say it was a delight to see to see that cross-functional team come together and just be running through the paces to constantly be thinking about all the elements of what the employees needed. So we have another question from Arsalan Khan. And Arsalan says, okay, so Dropbox is a tech company. And so how much is tech ingrained in the culture of the organization going beyond product development? For example, he says, example, IT uh, to improve internal processes. So I guess the question is tech culture versus work collaboration culture. Where does, where does Dropbox fit in that spectrum? Collaboration is at the heart of Dropbox uh, in the sense that our goal, again, and our mission is to design this more enlightened way of, of working and engaging with with each other as, as humans and as individuals and as team members. And the technology we use on a day-to-day -day basis is, is obviously on Dropbox, right? So we're on Dropbox platform. So we're living and breathing that very much so. Uh, and of course we use other applications, which is 
what we expect, right? We do want to give our customers choice. And that's why the Dropbox platform is designed in the way it is very open, integrated broadly into the ecosystem. And so we live and breathe that reality as well. And uh, the the teams very much feel like it's by um, by dog fooding our own products that we uh, that we're able to really make sure that yes, this is in fact what we're testing for our customers. Uh, but really, at the end, and by the way, if folks aren't familiar with dog fooding your own own products, it's kind of t- trying them yourself before you release them into the world. And as one one board member said uh, at at Dropbox is you could also think about it as drinking your own champagne, (laughs) which I thought was a nice way of framing it. It's really the humans at the center, right? Dropbox has a very unique culture and we take that very seriously. So it's less about tech or non-tech and it's more about uh, putting the individual and and each other in in a way that we really are coming together as a team and, and working together to drive to an outcome. It's kind of interesting because on the one hand, the lifeblood of the product is collaboration, as you've been describing, and yet the success of the product is all about technology infrastructure, because the technology problem that you're solving is a really, really hard one at the scale at which you you deal with it. Very much so. If you look even back into our history, uh, there were other players at the time that were offering ways to uh, share folders and collaborate on folders and share content, right? But uh, again, I wasn't here, but real kudos to the innovation and the and the leadership of Dropbox that just came out with an amazingly technically complex and very advanced way of solving that problem. But from a user perspective, it was simple and easy to use and you just couldn't help falling in love with it. We have another question from Twitter. What does the future of work look like? Is it just more working offsite or is it something beyond that? So what is the future of work? If I were to just break it down, right? One of the dimensions in terms of the future of work is, again, this intentionality of when do you need to get in a car and drive to the office, right? And and be with other people in a, in a, in a physical room, right? And then when actually are there immense benefits of working remote and distributed uh, and, and really being purposeful about that and mapping that out, right? And, and where are the ways in which we support that in-person work and how are the ways in which we support that more distributed work? Um, the other element, of course, is this, this diversity element that I mentioned before, which I f- am very passionate about, right, is how do you get the benefits of, hey, if there's, is there a much higher ratio, right, of in-office to remote, how do you use that to a company and a team's and, and really the world's advantage in engaging more diverse talent and bringing those folks into your thought process, right? Because we all know that you come up with better ideas if if there's more diversity. Uh, And so that also is a really important element of, of, of the future of work. I would also say that because we believe that there is a higher level of remote distribution in the future of work, then how do you really make sure that your employees have everything they need, right? So how do you make sure they have all of the technology it takes to work from work, right? Not only Dropbox itself as a platform, which obviously we believe plays a huge role, but also the screen and the keyboard and the chair and all that sort of stuff, right? And we've had to think about that. And um, we've obviously provided that to, to our employees to make sure that when they are working remote, they're comfortable and they're able to do it in a really seamless way. Uh, and then also the other elements of of that work-life balance, right? So how do you start to build norms around, okay, yes, you're at home, but you also do need help from your teams and others around you to set boundaries, right? So that, okay, work ends at a certain time and then you get to go be with whoever it is or do whatever activity that you wanna do. So I think that's also an element of the future of work, which is how do you enable and and, um, reinforce this boundary setting so that, people can be in flow, get amazing work done, and then turn it off uh, and go do things that that rejuvenate them or re-energize them so that the next day they can 
do some great work again. So in your mind, then the planning process for the future involves this mapping to use your term of uh, on, I was, I was going to say on premise, but working uh, in an office, the pros, the cons, the implications on the one hand, and then the working from home, the pros, the cons, the implications, and then figuring out intentionally, again, to use your term, uh, how do you bring those two together and in what manner and proportion? Exactly, yes. And obviously we, we listen to our employees, right? So we are asking our employees, well, how often would you think about needing an office experience? And, you know, we really want to make sure that this is something that we're thinking about intentionally. And, and obviously you see many companies in the Valley do, doing the same, but we're really, really trying to, to be thoughtful about the intended end state. So you think about that intended end state, uh, both in terms of the, the product, as well as your own internal operations. And obviously both of those both of those trains of thought respond to some kind of vision that you have of figuring all this out, I'm assuming. Very much so, yes. It's a team effort, I would say. <laughs> we have a question from Twitter. Is IT at Dropbox considered a strategic peer to help move the needle, or is IT just, are IT folks just order takers? We couldn't be here where we are today without Sylvie, who is our CIO. She's incredible. Her team is incredible. Uh, I mean, it, it was uh, almost on. I mean, it was awe inspiring and almost unbelievable, right? So, one day we were in the office. We had a meeting. We decided, okay, we'd be working from home, and I I didn't notice any different. I mean, that just is a huge testimony to an IT team. It was really, really incredible how, you know, our entire employee base was able to be remote within 24 hours. And um, that's a huge testimony. And I would say it's a strategic asset to have an IT team that's able to do that and pull that off is really, really impressive. And, and they continue to be very purposeful in the rollouts that I see, in the simplicity that they're driving for, for Dropbox and on behalf of Dropbox. And um, it's great to see the thought leadership there. And, and we wouldn't be able to do this without them, for sure. What kinds of interactions do you have with your customers in terms of them sharing their their work from homes or, or the, let's say their transition plans and where do you see the market the market being your customers going right now since uh, you know i've heard many many stories amazing stories like yours of these rapid transitions to work from home but now people are trying to figure out what to do next and it's really hard for all the reasons that we know Right. As you mentioned, we operate at scale, right? A tremendous scale. And that's fun. And, it, and we have a huge responsibility. It also means that we have very different types of businesses and, and companies and individuals. And um, we have uh, individual consumers, we have um, professionals, we have uh, small teams, mid-market teams, enterprise teams, like it is really an amazing thing that because of the love of the product and the organic adoption, it shows up kind of in all customer segments, right? So uh, all to say that it's not a simple answer to your question in terms of how they're thinking about the future, right? It, I think it comes in many different flavors for many different types of companies and customer segments. Uh, but we are seeing that there is a bit of a new normal for sure, right? This, uh, this need to use uh, technology as a as a platform, right? And 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 at scale, right? So uh, I'll give an example of the University of Michigan, right? So now their students are all using Dropbox because now they're taking classes remotely, they're onboarding remotely. They're it, it, it's truly a new world, and you know you can imagine a scenario in which in the future that's kind of standard right whether people are going into schools physically or not it, there's an understanding that there's this technology platform that 
offers choice and creates choice in how people interact and go about their business or their education or their nonprofit, right? And so I think that element that has been now kind of uh, driven by this, this reality that we're in will take on a more permanent place in how companies, nonprofits, and educational institutions operate for sure. You know, I'd like to go back to a comment that you made earlier about how remote working uh, favors the development of diverse teams. And certainly team diversity is such an enormous contributor to the success of the best teams. And so would you talk more about that and elaborate the, the or explain the mechanism that remote distributed working uses or, or the, the mechanism by which remote working helps create diverse teams? Sure. If we think about classic, what does it mean to go to work? <laughs> right? I think we, we uh, at least five or so years ago, would, um, would imagine it as you get in your car, you show up at the office at eight, at eight or nine o'clock, you spend the day there, you work all day, you, um, you leave the office at five or six, you come home, right? And, and that kind of repeats itself, right? And obviously um, you throw the realities of life in there and, and people start to opt out, right? So for whatever reason, maybe people can't get childcare or they can't get someone to take care of their elderly parent or the commute is just physically too long to make it worth being in the office for <laughs> that amount of time and all of these things. And I would say um, it, it affects a lot of people, right? It's not just a certain population that it affects, but it does affect certain populations more than others. And you see that in the numbers, right? And so for me, uh, this this increase in flexibility is really what it comes down to. I, I firmly believe, and as a, as a leadership at Dropbox, we firmly believe should give us, and, and we see it, right? In, in when we offer more flexibility, we get more diverse candidates. And, um, and that's really important to us. And we have that as a key value uh, for our company. And we have a, another comment from Twitter from Constance Woodson who says, these are great talking points, yet many workplaces intentionally hire mini-me's, meaning a non-diverse workforce. And that seems to be a continuing problem. So does, does the mere fact of working remotely cut through that, do you think? Or is there something else that needs to be done to create diversity when working from home? accountability is key. And I, I firmly believe that, that as you, um, in life, right, even if it's like set, setting self goals for yourself, or um, setting team goals, if you're like on a soccer team, like my daughter is, right, or at work, you set goals, all right, because that holds you and, and the folks working towards it accountable to try to achieve those goals. And not only do you set the goals, but you check in on those goals and you say, how are we doing against these goals? And if it's not working and you're not pacing quickly enough to the end state that you're trying to get to or that, that goal that you've set, then you take the time to say, okay, why aren't where we will be? What can we do about it? all of those things, right? And I think the same holds through for, for the topic of diversity because it's a fundamental, uh, important topic in our lives today. And so, yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm all about, you actually have to set goals and, and the leadership at Dropbox is all about, you know, we set, we set very clear, um, we really are thoughtful about where we want to be and it's not haphazard or if it happens, that's okay. Like we're very intentional and thoughtful about that so that we can really continue to move the ball forward. And presumably you then establish metrics along with that, I, I would assume. Yeah, we're checking in on how we're doing, right? We want to make sure that we're moving that ball forward. And um, and the team does an amazing job of that. And And also I would say the second element of that is resourcing it, right? So uh, it's not enough to set the goals and to try to ball, move the ball forward, but actually putting the resources against it that are necessary to do that, right? So do you have a recruiting team that um, is resourced to go 
to go do those outreaches and all of that. And at Dropbox, we take that very seriously and our people team take it very seriously and, and really do put in that investment because, you know, you can't have one without the other. You can't set the goal and then not resource it, right? So it's really important to us and, and we kind of put our resources where where we say our intent is and those two things need to come together. And, and I'm really pleased and, and honored in, in seeing how it comes together at Dropbox. There's always more work to do, right? I would not say that uh, check we figured it out that, uh, <laughs> right? I think there's always more work to do. And so we take that very seriously as well. We, we keep, keep pushing. Another question from Twitter. How do new ways of working impact, affect work processes, operations, and practices? It's an interesting question. You're the chief operating officer of Dropbox. So how does remote work affect operations, the basic operations of running a business? There's a couple elements of this. One is your processes need to be very explicit and very well documented. And and they need to be as simple as possible, right? Because um, it needs to be easy to communicate to someone who's joining in a remote world for the first time to your company, right? And so we've really thought about what are what is the onboarding process? There's been great work on that. But then what are the processes that we think are key processes that stretch across the company and make it so fundamental to how we do work that really everyone needs to be trained up on it and have very um, clear understanding of what the roles and responsibilities are. Uh, so 100% those processes are really important. And, and we've been doing um, work on that at Dropbox to really make explicit even more explicit, some of those, those processes. I would say the other element is figuring out the way to do human connection that is not, and I know we all know this, right, but is not stopping in the hall, grabbing lunch together, peering over someone's shoulder at their desk and saying, oh, that's how you do that model, or, you know, whatever it is, that level of apprenticeship that uh, in person played a large role in, right? So how do you make sure people are connecting on a personal basis, that the apprenticeship is occurring, that the development is occurring. So we've been also thinking a lot about that, right? So how do you create forums for people just to be relaxed and hang out, right? At, at my staff meetings, we um, think about, you know, what, how are we doing professionally, but how, also how are we doing personally and going around and, and sharing that and being really open with each other right, about this is you know, I'll, an example from my world, right, is I have two kids who are at school remotely, right, and so I, <laughs> I'll, it's a battle for Wi-Fi sometimes, right, so, you know, there's a, a whole reality of that person that you're just seeing as a two-dimensional image on the other side of Zoom that you really have to get to know, uh, and in a very intentional way, uh, because, um, that that in office or that in person interaction is not happening. So that's a, an important way as well. And and how do you do that? That isn't necessarily more video conferencing, right? Because there's also this reality of there's only so many hours of video conferencing someone can do in one day, right? So do you just jump on the phone and have a chat? Uh, go for a walk while doing a one on one and on the phone, right? And really mixing it up so that people can have the personal interaction, but they're also not tethered to the video conference. It definitely seems like the ability to collaborate more informally is much is much more difficult when we're working remotely and distributed. Well, I would just say there's certain elements that we might want to go back to the future on, right? So picking up the call and, and having, I know I, I did a couple of one-on-ones yesterday and I was on a walk with my dog for all of them, right? And, and <laughs> And and my the the folks that are on the call, I'm sure we're doing other stuff that they kind of just needed to do to get their head cleared, right? And so giving each other permission is really important, right? That this is a uh, we, we yeah we're gonna fi- all figure out our own way of doing this, and it's okay. It's 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 okay not to be sitting there perfectly on the other side of the screen. Um, if you've got stuff to do, or you just want to go outside, or uh, and need a bit of a mental break. I think we do need to figure that out and be kind with each other about that, what that looks and feels like. I was going to say that for many companies, especially uh, larger, older companies, 
this requires a real culture change that's very hard. If your company is used to doing things a particular way, and there is that veneer of being perfect all the time, this is a different way of thinking. Very much so. And, and I do believe that um, one of the things that we take uh, as, as the kernel of Dropbox is the humanity of our products, right? Of meeting our users where they are and meeting our customers where they are, right? And how we engage on a day-to-day um, is a bit of that as well, right? So if I decide that what I really need is to go on a run at 7.30 and I show up you know, in my running outfit to my eight o'clock staff meeting, I think that can start to be okay, right? I mean, I, that's what I do. <laughs> uh, and I think people just, especially at this time where there's a lot going on that people just wanna be themselves as much as possible. And to the extent that companies and cultures can allow that, I think that will be healthy and good, um, both for, for the employee and the individuals. And, you know, you just have to believe if you do the right thing for your employees, that that's, that's also great for your company, but really starting with the individual and, and the culture first. As we finish up, any final pieces of advice for folks who are trying to manage this transition, the transition from the transition to all this change, that's rapid change that's going, taking place right at this moment? I would say just be kind to yourself. It's a hard uh, time. There's been a lot of changes, <laughs> and uh, I know I, you know I make mistakes every day, right? And uh, we all will make mistakes as we are on this journey, right? But uh, learning from those mistakes and understanding, uh, okay, this is a new world for me. How do I operate in this world, right? Uh, as a mother. I have a lot of adjusting to do, of, as I mentioned, in home school as a, as a wife, right? My, my husband's also working from home. And, and obviously, as someone who's trying to really do what's right for Dropbox, I have those elements as well. And of course, you're not going to always get them all right, <laughs> right? And, and that's just me. People have other elements that, that they're focused on, whether it be other family members or things that they do, right, that are important to them. And I think kindness um, kindness to yourself is is um, probably one of the most important because it's you know, it's different times and we'll get to that end state that very intentional end state but until then you know we'll be kind of bumping along a bit and that's okay and it's not meant to be perfect. The message of being kind to everybody that sure sounds like a great one. We've been speaking with Olivia Nottebaum. She is the chief operating officer of Dropbox. Olivia, thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. Thank you, Michael. Everybody, next week, we are talking with the chief information officer of Logitech. So check it out. Be sure to subscribe to our website and subscribe to our YouTube channel as well. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks to Olivia. I really appreciate all the folks who ask questions. I hope you have a great day and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.